to the Prime Minister of Japan, although you are more than 8,500 kilometers away from the Islamic State, you willingly have volunteered to take part in this crusade. America and its allies remain committed to fighting and defeating the cowards who strike with suicide bombs and masked men threatening execution of hostages. But we only have so many people and resources, while the killers seem to only multiply. How do we avoid becoming so strung out on the war that we are becoming mostly ineffective in? Let's welcome to Midpoint three-term Rhode Island State Representative, retired Lieutenant Colonel in the U.S. Army Reserve, 26-year veteran and current Rhode Island House Veterans Affairs Committee member, John Laughlin joins us today. John, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Ed. Great to be here. I'm going to talk a little bit about ISIS in a moment, but I want to get your reaction, first of all, to what is happening right now. In Yemen, the presidential palace has been completely taken over by rebels. Apparently, the prime minister's residence also under attack from the street. We are told that this is the completion of a coup, and the president has no control. Knowing full well that many of the terrorists are emanating from Yemen, how do we then look at this action here? And I guess some people would say, well, good, the old government is out, but wait a minute now. Now you have the terrorists in control. Yeah, I mean, this is a pattern that we've seen, unfortunately, repeated uh, throughout the Arab world. And, and unfortunately, um, our foreign policy seems to be largely reactive. We don't seem to take a, an activist view to, you know, stemming these problems before they, before they really begin. Um, and, and we saw it in Iraq. We saw it when we uh, left Iraq without a status of forces agreement uh, that we clearly should have had. Uh, and that, that single, singular event I think in many respects led to the rise of ISIS and a lot, a rise to a lot of the instability that we have. And, you know, it almost seems as though the president's foreign policy is, is taking a, a, uh, the moniker, what's a mother to do? Uh, it seems like we're reacting continually and we're not proactively, you know, heading off these situations before they really get out of control. Do you agree with those who say that unless we spend the money, unless we put more millions, more weapons, more people, boots on the ground, if you will, however you want to phrase it, but unless we get behind these governments like Yemen, they are doomed to failure, and we are going to be fighting this war forever. We must get involved. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be reactive. Uh, it's going to be a reactive posture. I mean, clearly the plan in Iraq was to have a 15,000-member uh, quick reaction force and sustainment training force in Iraq, uh, and we had the opportunity to do that, but we basically let um, Nouri al-Maliki uh, tell us, no, uh, we're not going to allow it. And we took the tack that, well, okay, if that's what you say, that's what you say. And now we're in a situation where um, much more force is going to be required. Had that force been in place, I think you, I believe that you would not have seen the rise of ISIS, certainly within the borders of Iraq. What is it going to take then, Lieutenant Colonel, for us to stop always, whether it's you and I having a conversation or myself and any other member of the military, Congress, or whatever, to continually use the phrase, if we had if we had done this, why didn't we do this? What is it going to take then to finally get us off that? Because I got to be honest with you, the American people are tired of hearing that. They want to hear something moving forward. Yeah, I mean, clearly it's going to take a foreign policy that recognizes and, you know, the legitimate threats that we face throughout the world. Uh, and it's going to take uh, executive leadership that's willing to to commit to making sure that those threats don't emerge. And, but what is that? And what is, excuse me, for, excuse me if I can, though. That is kind of symptomatic of where we are right now. Excuse me if I can, though. What does that executive leadership, though, need to do in order to push it forward? We keep hearing that. We got you, executive leadership. But now let's take it the next step. What's got to be done? Substantive action. Well, the substantive action that ultimately is going to have to take place, whether we do it now or whether we do it later, is we're going to have to deal with the ISIS threat uh, in a meaningful way and in a way that um, does not allow them the base to be able to propagate um, additional instability throughout the Middle East. And that's going to take boots on the ground. It's going to take a force. Unfortunately, it's going to take a force back into Iraq to make sure that we have the military capability to be able to eradicate the threat. In your opinion, are we already, our military forces, too strung out and in too many places for us to be effective? No, not at all. Not at all. With, uh, with the proper funding, which we've seen deteriorate, uh, we've seen an army that is now you know, in the process of going through a reduction in force. Um, with, the, with those actions reversed, we certainly have the military capability to do it. The U.S. military is the most capable military that the world has ever seen. Uh, and when employed properly and, and done in a way that, that is consistent with long-term planning, 
then you know the the effects can be dramatic and and I think the effects could be to to mitigate a lot of the problems that we have right now. All right, now you just talked a little bit about budgets. So if you would please hold tight, Lieutenant Colonel, because that's what we're going to do when we come back after the break. We're going to discuss the fact that American military morale is right now at one of its lowest points, and then there comes the point of money and spending that money to actually go forward and how it needs to be spent. Also coming up a little bit later on, right here on Newsmax and on Midpoint at 43 minutes after the hour, let's go ahead and discuss what Martin Luther King Jr. would say about a football tweet. It's all part of political correctness and more. That when we continue right here on Midpoint. Welcome back to Midpoint. Three-time Rhode Island State Representative, retired Lieutenant Colonel in the U.S. Army Reserve, and current Rhode Island House Veterans Affairs Committee member, John Laughlin. Lieutenant Colonel, let's look at some real numbers here. Russia is slashing its defensive budget to compensate for all the sanctions that they're currently under. Japan has approved the largest ever defense budget since World War II. Meantime, we in America are cutting our European military bases as the budget's shrink. Now there are those who say, wait a minute, we can cut it. We're still an effective fighting force even with these cuts. But looking at what Russia, Japan and others are doing, plus the fight against terrorism, can we even hope to keep up if we don't put more money into our military? Well, I mean, clearly, you know, all budgets are really discussions of priorities. And our national priority has to be first and foremost on protecting our citizens, both here in the United States and abroad. Um, and we've got to see that level of commitment. Now, it doesn't, to me, make sense at a time when you've got increased instability, when Iraq has basically fallen into disarray, when it's entirely possible at the end of any sort of uh, meaningful troop pullout that you're going to see Afghanistan fall into disarray. It doesn't make sense to me to cut defense budgets uh, to the extent that we've cut them. And again, budgets are an expression of national priority, and clearly our priority is not on national defense. What will it take then to make national defense a priority? Because let's face it, that has to be not only the president, that has to be Congress, and that has to be the American people who believe that that money is going to be spent properly, and it's really going to make a difference and make us safer. One word, leadership. It takes national leadership. It needs to recognize that we face serious threats. Uh, it takes leadership to, uh, to, to define those threats and to make that case for the American people and for Congress. And it takes leadership in, in beginning to be devising a strategy to be, a, be able to provide some stability nation, uh, worldwide. But with that, we keep hearing that again and again. I want to push you on this because we continue sure. to hear the thing about leadership here. All right, let's, let's make it a given here. We know for the purposes of this discussion that Barack Obama is not the leader that we need in this country right now, militarily, not getting the job done. So then knowing full well that he is going to be in office for the next two years, we then have two years. Are, do we just sit here and wait and allow the body bags yeah, I'm, to count for two years? I'm very hopeful that, uh, that Congress is going to begin to apply the, the needed pressure to, uh, to be able to move. I mean, the Iran sanctions bill, I think, is very, very important. Uh, that's got bipartisan support in both the House and Senate. The president has already said, has telegraphed that he's going to veto that. Uh, we cannot allow a, a nuclear Iran. Uh, and to the extent that we're you know, negotiating as they're buying time to complete their preparations for nuclear, nuclear war, uh, it really puts us in a, in a very, very difficult position. So it's up to Congress now, unfortunately, to fill that vacuum and to provide that leadership. All right. So to the people then in Congress, you know these people very well. You know what goes on inside the Beltway. Are the people who are sitting there right now, do they have the spine to get it done? Time will tell. Well, I, I got to really, ask, wait a minute. I can't hold you to time. Time will tell now because we've got people sitting there. But I got to press you on this. The people sure. who are there right now and you talked about the fact that we've got to get Democrats involved. Do they, in your opinion, have the spine to make the hard choices? Again, you know, and not not to be evasive, certainly, but uh, we haven't seen this Congress really in action yet. I mean, they've literally just convened. It's going to be a matter of, of uh, developing the strategy that, uh, that the congressional leadership needs to move forward. Look, you know, again, it's all about priorities. And Congress has a, a tremendous role to set in setting those priorities. And, and it's, it's hopeful that the leadership in Congress is going to recognize this threat before we have some sort of a catastrophe right here in the United States from our, our lack of vigilance on the national uh, worldwide stage. I guess here's another part of that. Where do we get the money? Well, again, budgets are about priorities. And it's about setting the priorities that make sense. I mean, does it make sense necessarily to commit billions of dollars to community college at a time when we're cutting our military budget. 
Is that a priority that can wait? And again, budgets are about priorities. And so it's up to Congress and certainly the House of Representatives that controls the purse strings to set those priorities and to force the president into a position where, you know, he's going to have to recognize a threat that's legitimate. But again, ultimately, you know, a lot of that leadership has to come from the executive. And, and as you so eloquently stated, we have a president who has not even recognized the threat, who won't verbalize the threat, and, and who is continually moving in directions that uh, that gut our military and put us in a weaker position. We cannot can't go forward that way. And and then hopefully that, you know, that we're not going to have a situation in which we have another 9-11 that forces us into a more aggressive posture. I got about 45 seconds left. I want to spin to the recent video we found from ISIS or we've seen from ISIS where they have two Japanese individuals that are threatening execution. In your opinion, should we continue to show those pictures or are we just aiding and abetting them when we show those to the American public? What we need to do is we need to deal with ISIS effectively. And the way we deal with ISIS effectively, unfortunately, is going to be a commitment of U.S. forces in Iraq to be able to, in Iraq and in Syria, to be able to to diminish that threat. That's that's what it's going to take. And, and, you know, the videos, that's a news media decision whether or not to air those things. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's about about actually neutralizing that threat in a meaningful way and not uh, the strategy that we have right now. All right, Lieutenant Colonel John Laughlin, I do appreciate your comments. As always, I'll look forward to the next time we gather. Thank you very much. All right, other side of the break, the former congressman who is tired of all the sympathy and political correctness being exhibited by what some consider the weaker side of America. That would be the PC. And at 34 minutes after the hour, the Facebook effect on business, profits, and jobs, it's with or without anyone actually liking their status. No, please don't.